This content is independently created by Bloodstream Media. Novartis is our exclusive advertising partner. Welcome to the PNH Podcast. We're really glad you're here. Today, we want to take you to the future. It's the year 2023. George Jetson is one year old. We're four years into the Blade Runner universe. Still six years away from the Terminator. And 150 years away from the Matrix. And over 200 years from Star Trek. Let's call this the early future. Too soon for flying cars. But just right if you're really into making 30 second long videos on the internet. And just right to discuss the future of PH care and management. We're back with Dr. Chonat and Dr. Weitz for this episode of the PH Podcast. Thanks for joining us. To discuss the future of PH care, it's important to review where we've been and where we are today. Dr. Chonat and Dr. Weitz weigh in on the current standard of care for people with PH and how those standards have evolved over the recent years. The treatment of choice. Uh, in the modern era is complement inhibition. And um, how you decide which complement inhibitor you want to use depends on whether you're in hospital or out out of hospital. Just a reminder that complement inhibitors target different levels in the steps of the complement cascade, and they're used to stop the destruction of red blood cells. The standard of care now for anyone who gets diagnosed with PNH, if it's clinically uh, significant, is to start complement inhibition therapy as soon as possible because it can minimize the uh, hemolysis or anemia, avoid red cell transfusions. And uh, with regards to what has been done, what has evolved in the recent years is ensuring what's the right type of medication, whether it's a shorter acting, longer acting, given intravenously or subcutaneously. All of my patients are on long acting C5 inhibition just because it's easier for the patient, it's easier for the doctor, it's not so many visits. As I mentioned earlier, there are agents which can be given every eight weeks or or subcutaneous twice a week. Some patients may prefer one over the other, but it's important to recognize some of the pros and cons of these medications. And I think um, the the supportive care remains to be addressed and, uh, and addressed on a regular basis. They can get their treatment either at a center or at in my center, or they can get their treatment at home. And um, the long-acting inhibitor, for example, used to be an hour plus infusion. Now it's down to 35 minutes. So uh, it makes it really easier for the patient. And if the patient's tolerated the drug, well, they don't need to be watched for an hour after their infusion. So I recently had that question posed to me by one of my patients because you know, she works and she doesn't want to sit in a chair for an extra hour. So the truth is 15 minutes, if she's not have, had a reaction by then, she's not going to have a reaction. Hematologists with expertise in PNH who take care of PNH patients on a regular basis uh, probably do this in a, during every clinic visit, but it's important that uh, a community hematologist, if they're following a PNH patient who may only have one patient in the entire practice of, of PNH, it's important that they actually continue to discuss this with someone with expertise. And I think our goals are, goalposts have been moving forward. We wanted to block the complement. Now we, we, were, we were fine with the hemoglobin, which has improved. We were feeling better by avoiding transfusion, but now we want the hemoglobin to be normal. And we want now then the patients to actually have least amount of fatigue or other associated symptoms. So our quality of care for these patients are continually evolving. So that's where we are now. We'll be back to discuss the future of PH treatment and management right after this quick break. This is an ad for Novartis, the exclusive advertising partner for PH, Fax Fiction, and FYI. Ever wonder is my PH well controlled or how bad do my symptoms need to get before I talk to my doctor? You can get the answers you need at explorepnh.com. There, you'll learn that any symptoms, mild or severe, may be a sign your PNH isn't well controlled, and that because PNH is different for everyone, it's important to let your doctor know how you're feeling. So, if you want to deepen your understanding of PNH, which can help you advocate for yourself and your needs, get answers and helpful resources at explorepnh.com. Brought to you by Novartis. And we're back. Let's jump back to the future. 
be a great name for a movie. No way. It's too confusing. Back to the future? What does that even mean? In the P&H sphere, it means promising new therapies and treatment approaches that are being developed. I think in addition to uh, some of the newer agents uh, that's already been approved, which is shown to have uh, an improvement in hemoglobin, I would say certainly exciting in terms of ongoing studies is the oral agents. And I think it's really exciting because these agents are oral agents. Some of the studies are being very uh, exciting in terms of the data that we actually are seeing. And this is certainly going to change the face. How are we going to treat these patients? Uh, are we going to start them up front? Or are we going to actually wait till they actually fail the other treatments? Uh, who are these uh, patients that we can actually switch from an ongoing drug to something new? Recently, the C3 inhibitor was approved, given subcutaneously two to three times a week. And it definitely improves uh, the anemia, even in patients who are on a C5 inhibitor. So one of the interesting things that was observed probably 15 years ago by Antonio Ricitano and his mentor was that if you block complement at C5 using the drugs that we had available, you will accumulate a protein C3B, a complement protein 3B on the cells. Well, C3B is what you use to tag things like bacteria and viruses and dead and dying cells. So these cells now are tagged and they all get cleared out by the splenic macrophage, which eats those tagged cells. I think I follow. So the protein C3B binds to the surface of bacteria, viruses, and dead or dying cells. And this tagging, as Dr. White's put it, helps certain cells like macrophages recognize and engulf or eat the tagged particles more effectively. This whole process of binding, tagging, and engulfing or eating is called opsonization, and it helps clear the blood of potential pathogens and cellular debris. Right. So now imagine if you could use opsonization to your advantage. Researchers are now exploring ways to use antibodies or other molecules to enhance opsonization and increase the immune system's effectiveness in targeting specific diseases. These patients can develop what we call extravascular hemolysis. PNH by itself is exclusively intravascular. The destruction of the red blood cells occurs in the vascular space. But when you block with a C5 inhibitor, you accumulate the C3B, so now you've blocked the intravascular component, but you have extravascular clearance of the cells. So the patients may still have anemia, they all have high retic counts, so they're still making lots of cells, but some patients are actually transfusion dependent. And the amount of C3B you accumulate depends on your complement receptor one polymorphism. And that determines if you're a high expressor or a low expressor of C3B. So it blocks the accumulation of C3B on the membrane, on the red cells. So it sounds like with the right medicine, you can control how much of those tags are available to mark cells to be eaten by the splenic macrophage and ultimately control your levels of red blood cells. So that has been approved by the FDA. It's out there and available for use. It's subcutaneous. There is less experience with its effect on thrombosis, but it does appear that it does suppress thrombosis as well. And we're waiting approval for a factor B inhibitor. So it blocks the alternative pathway of complement. And that allows for blocking the development of C3 as well as C5 inhibition. This is fascinating. But there are so many variations of blood disorders and differences. This can't work for everyone, can it? Actually, there are several other drugs being developed that aim to do similar things depending on the patient's specific needs, including how the medicine is administered. As I mentioned, there are other drugs in trial. There's a factor D inhibitor. So factor B works on the in the alternative pathway to create C3B. Uh, its cofactor is factor D. There's a lectin pathway inhibitor that's being evaluated. There are different C5 inhibitors that are being evaluated, uh, which work at a slightly different uh, site in C5 and can be given sub-Q once a month. 
that's still in trial. It hasn't been approved yet. There's one, um, which is a C5 inhibitor that's coupled with a small interfering RNA that blocks the production of C5. So all of these are out there. Which one will rise to the top is unclear, but um, I think that there are all going to be options for patients. I think it's going to be even more exciting but challenging in terms of understanding who are these patients who may benefit from one drug over the other. Do we switch a patient who's doing really well on one drug with no side effects, great complement inhibition, and do we change them to something uh, which just because they could be taken by mouth? And are we going to start doing combination therapy if, uh, since one medication may not be completely blocking off the um, uh, anemia or complement activation, some of these patients. So, th so these th questions remains to be answered, uh, but those exciting because those treatment approaches are coming, uh, continually being looked into and studied. When discussing the future of medicine, the topic on everyone's mind is gene therapy. Gene therapy is being tested and in some cases approved for a wide spectrum of diseases, disorders, and cancers. Following the proposal in 1973, it took almost 30 years for gene therapy to have a clinical trial. It would be another 25 years before the first gene therapy treatment was approved in the U.S. So this is really the early future of gene therapy. And how does it impact people with PNH? Are there gene therapies out there? Um, at the moment, no. The problem with PNH and with this pig A mutation is that a lot of them are frame shifts. It doesn't lend itself towards gene replacement, at least at the present time. That might change because we have newer and better gene therapy agents. With regards to um, genetic testing, the only genetic testing that we do in patients with PNH are they, if they have a bone marrow failure. So looking to see if the bone marrow failure may be uh, secondary to some put particular genetic abnormality which may require, for example, a bone marrow transplant uh, or certain treatments. The genetic testing is not routinely used to diagnose PNH. PNH is diagnosed by uh, using a flow cytometry. That's the way we take the blood from the patient. We stain those red blood cells and white blood cells with a, a variety of colored markers. And then we see where these markers are present on the red cells are absent as in PNH. It's easy to make the diagnosis of PNH now. You just need to send a purple top tube for flow cytometry. If that is not satisfactory, you can do next gen sequencing. And the pig A mutation is a constant in PNH. It's always there if you have PNH. If it's not there, then there's some other process going on. People have, in the research setting, done some genetic testing related to the gene which is affected in PNS, what's called as a pig A gene or pig R gene, but it is not routinely done clinically. But having said that, with regard to the newer treatments, understanding the PNH at more of a cellular level, I think that's what's going to change with regard to the precision medicine, what medicine may be perfectly beneficial for certain patient age and comorbidities. Um, so that's certainly what we actually go into the field of uh, understanding and, and defining uh, certain inclusion exclusion criteria that the patients may benefit from um, rather than having to do more of a trial and error basis. Right now, we're not looking at gene therapy as a treatment for PNH. But we are only in the early future, and there is still much to learn about gene therapy in general. So, if not gene therapy, what does the foreseeable future hold for patients with PNH? With regards to innovation, I think using the most proximal pathway inhibitors, so C5 is lower down in the complement pathway or on the, in the terminal pathway, and higher up is a C3 inhibitor which is available but what's exciting is that there's several work being done which can block factor B or B for Bravo, D for Delta and the other agents which are being studied. So these uh, newer agents may actually uh, have a way that they can actually block not just the complement mediated intravascular hemolysis but also some of the extravascular hemolysis that we see in some of these patients which can be up to a third or even higher number of patients on C5 inhibition. This is going on for the last few years, but what we need now is long-term safety data. We want to make sure that these medications, in addition to the clinical trials, they remain safe for many number of years. And that long-term safety data remains 
that that's how it's going to find some of this, uh, um, these medications. Um, several of the studies are ongoing, but I think we need more and more to be able to feel safe and feel comfortable with some of this medication. It's also important that a number of studies are uh, looking at two drugs head-on-head head or against each other. So comparative efficacy of these PNH therapies are extremely important. We want to make sure that one drug does better than the other. So they're doing trials where the patients on one study, they take them off that drug, put them on this new drug, and see how their hemoglobin does, for example. Do they become transfusion independent if they were dependent before and so on. And so understanding the differences between these drugs in the same group of patients, for example, is going to be really, really uh, helpful. The administration, the convenience of administration is certainly important, not just IV or given under the skin. Uh, how can we deliver better or different modes of deliver delivery? People are trying to have a device that they can stick onto their arm or shoulder or the abdomen that can deliver the medication slowly while they go about doing their routine work. So they don't have to necessarily come into the hospital, spend hours getting this medication. Now that sounds like the future to me. So the convenience of administration is going to be key in moving forward. What's also more important is what's going to happen to the patients who miss a dose or don't get this medication on time or do may actually are not feeling well enough to take the medication or they have an infection in these circumstances, they could have a breakdown of red blood cells in spite of being on a regular treatment. So that risk of breakthrough hemolysis for any of these reasons I mentioned earlier remains an ongoing concern and more so a concern with the newer treatments since they studied for a shorter duration of time. So we might not have enough time to understand the safety of some of these agents. There is a long way to go but it's exciting that we actually have a lot of options currently and even more options coming up in the near, near future. I didn't really talk about uh, something like bone marrow transplant, which has a role in some patients. So if the patient has PNH, but is primarily a plastic, then consideration of bone marrow transplant should be significant. So the patient I told you about who just finished college uh, he didn't have a sibling match, but he has 85 matches in the bank. So, you know, he's only 22 years old. I wouldn't want to have this disease for the rest of my life. So that certainly remains a consideration, especially in the young ones and in the kids. But in the absence of that, ultimately something like a gene therapy strategy would be ideal so that you could cure these patients. All the treatments we have right now are Band-Aids. They don't really cure the patient. They block the symptoms, but they don't cure the patient. Treatment options for PNH are numerous. And more treatment options are on the way. Though it might be discouraging to hear that the current strategy is more focused on symptom management rather than curative measures. What role do clinical trials play in all this? Dr. Chonat weighs in. There are clinical trials that are actually looking at uh, the outcomes um, in these patients with regards to most of the clinical trials that's done now do include how the patient's feeling. They, many of these patients have to fill out a questionnaire with regards to their symptoms uh, before going getting on the clinical trial, while on the clinical trial, and a few weeks after. And that has really helped understand in terms of the burden of the disease, not just with regards to anemia what, that we can see using a blood test, but not able to quantify how the patient's actually feeling. In addition to that, clinical trials, the other set of clinical studies uh, that's actually been really helpful is the uh, real world data. So actually doing studies on the patients or receiving medications which are already approved and understanding how the patient's doing outside the clinical trial setting. So these are patients who go about doing everything what they have to do, but not part of a clinical trial, but getting the medication which are approved by the insurance agency and studying those patients to see how they actually respond to the medications. That real world data is extremely important because how patients respond during clinical trial, which is very structured, they've been spoken to on a regular basis, examined, their blood's been tested compared to the real world patients where they actually are kind of left on their own, but also closely monitored and studied. And those patient studies are extremely important in understanding how each of these drugs do. Clinical trials and new research are setting the foundation for treatment and management of PNH. So you could kind of say we're in an adolescent stage of the future of PNH. Just like how George Jetson is one year old. You really love that fact. He's out there toddling around somewhere and it vexes me. 
Gay, are we really at episode five already? I know, it flew by. I guess that's all we got. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this season of the PH Podcast. Thank you to all of our fantastic guests. We couldn't have done it without you. And we really couldn't have done it without you, Kay, and you, listeners. We miss you already. That's a wrap. That's a wrap. On the PH Podcast. Facts, Facts fiction, fiction, and, and FYI. FYI. We kind of nailed that. Took five episodes. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.